Swinburne University of Technology. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to number four class. Not me, the subject. Um, the category, the, what do we call it? The way society stratified. Um, class, class is one of the fundamental, class, <laughs> I'm feeling a bit, <laughs> bit silly with this, David. Um, we'll come back to this. I think I've worn out my interest in Bob Dylan. Um, did I say subterranean homesick blues? Did I say that earlier? Maybe not. Um, if you want to know, go to YouTube, put in subterranean homesick blues and you'll see it if you don't know it. Um, you're hearing me, by the way, eh? Good. Um, so, class, uh, if you take your mind back to when I was talking about the founding fathers, because fathers they were, uh, Marx and Weber were, were two of them, and um, they did a lot of work on class. Um, in fact, Marx, Marx's work is, I suppose, most, most closely identified with, with the notion of class. Class... Um, um, Sometimes I think class is an old-fashioned concept, but um, it's, uh, it becomes submerged and sub subsumed more today, I th think, than ever before because of consumption society. Um, the idea of class is that it marks our position in society, and in days gone by and in, in other cultures, particularly, say, England or India, where class markers are... Um, much, much more easily identified um, and identifiable, um, much, um, much more severely stratified in in that it's in it's less so the case in India these days, but it it was the the case because of the caste system. You couldn't move out of the class in which you were into which you were born. Um, so to, to England to, to a certain extent as well. But there was also identification with class um, and a solidarity. Uh, and I'm thinking really as a 20th century nation, there was a solidarity built around class where people wouldn't want to uh, move out of their, their class uh, boundaries that that this this gave them an identity a sense of of purpose and a, and a sense of unity um, and it was funny where my 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 mother's father worked all his life in a in a department store um, in a this is in Wollongong in a small department store uh, which was taken over by a slightly larger department store which was taken over by David Jones eventually and my grandfather worked on the floor on the shop floor all his life and it was only it was only after he died that we were to, when we were talking about him that, that my my mother mentioned to me that that he wouldn't take a management job he wanted to stay on the shop floor he was a and I didn't realise this either, because um, I would have taken some pride in it. I suppose he was he was the shop steward. He was the the representative of the workers on the floor. And despite the fact that he spent his whole life there in this this one institute, well, these three institutions that that sort of all culminated in in the the final one. Um, so he was experienced. He knew what he was doing, but. He was not prepared to take a management position because it was a management position. I mean, that even even when I sort of found this out 20 years ago, I was I was sort of bemused um, and and a bit befuddled by it. But um, also came to understand the extent to which he identified with his class and the class boundaries and the ideology that 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 imposed or he chose to to impose upon himself and i suppose limit his life chances limit limit his opportunity to increase his income to increase his status um, and maybe even change some of those cultural symbols like the home in which he lived and the sort of um, material objects that that he owned um, class was so strong for him that 
that he was prepared to limit those other things in his life because of, of his, his weddedness to, to this, this class position. Um, I think those days have gone. Um, I don't, uh, not wholly, I, I still think there, there are people who, who are sort of more hardcore about, about their relationship particularly. Um, you'd, you'd think in the, the union movement, because we always think of, of those sort of things as, as a sort of an upward movement um, rather than a downward movement, and it is far easier, I suppose, to move up than move out. It's hard not to be rich. Um, and, and even if you eschew wealth, um, that the categorization is slightly different. So you become eccentric rather than, than um, populating another class to, to, to a lot of extent. Um, now, fundamentally, it's, uh, the, the, the notion about class is built on Marx. Karl Marx's basic notion of there being a strict division between two groups. The groups are the proletariat, who are the, the working class, uh, and the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie are the ruling class or the upper class. Now, Marx's fundamental notion um, was that these, there, there's a strict division between these two groups, and never the twains meet. There was, he, um, he theorized, uh, a petty bourgeoisie uh, who weren't influential really at all, and they were sort of like the milk bar owners um, uh, the very small business owners who, who really weren't engaged in this, this dynamic uh, of owning and being subject to the means of production that, that Marx was keenly interested in that uh, occurred between the pro proletariat and the bourgeoisie. So Marx's basic notion was that the bourgeoisie owned the means of production. That is, they owned the factories. Those things that we were talking about um, in, in the Industrial Revolution and in the industrialization process, the, the people and the blokes will say, because they were then, uh, who owned these factories that were running the, um, what do you call them, the production lines, who were employing other blokes like Fre Frederick Winslow Taylor to make sure the workers were conforming to the production line, were the bourgeoisie whose interests were purely in profit. And this is, this is the, the original Marxist notion. And so all that they did was designed to oppress the proletariat, to make sure that the proletariat, the workers, um, were subject to their interests and their needs, uh, and ultimately uh, their profits. So you had this notion of the, owner, uh, the owners of the means of production being the bourgeoisie, a very small group, and then the workers who who were subject to the means of production and all they had to do, all they had to offer in this dynamic was their labour and so they could only sell their labour but because there were so many of them obviously the, the, the price that they could, at which they could sell their labour was, was relatively low whereas the, the, the price that, that the bourgeoisie were getting for the products of these people's labour were, were much inflated. So Marx saw this division as strict and abiding, but also he saw this, this division, which was based on capitalism, uh, he saw this as the undoing of capitalism, because Marx ultimately believed that once the bourgeois, the proletariat, the workers, realised what their position was in relation to the means of production, um, that is, they developed a class consciousness, um, they would rise up, and overthrow the, uh, the system, the bourgeoisie, and then the means of production was, would be owned by all and the profits distributed amongst all of the owners. Now this was the, 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 sort of the, the general idea of Marxism. It was, it was a more organic process rather than a process that was imposed, which we saw in the two, I suppose, great, in inverted commas, communist regimes of Russia and China, where the, there was a, a violent imposition of, of this sort of ideology um, that, that sort of got rid of not only the, the, sort of the bourgeoisie, but the intellectuals and the elites and the, um, the, the, sort of the, the royal families as well, I suppose, or those, um, those people who were 
in sort of hereditary positions of power and authority. Um, the problem, and Marx was, if um, Marx was, <laughs> was quite prescient. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of stuff that he wrote about capitalism that that sort of has come true in the same way that Weber's stuff about bureaucracy has come true in inverted commas in that sort of Disney thing of everything coming true. Um, but the flaw in Marx's um, analysis and and thesis about uh, capitalism actually being the uh, the author of its own undoing because of this process uh, of of the oppressive relationship between the two groups was subverted, funnily enough, by the welfare state. So in the in the late in the second half of the twentieth century, after the the Great Depression in the the thirties and and the Second World War, um, the the winning countries if you, um, got together uh, at a place called Bretton Woods, um, which is um, in the northeast of America, and determined on a, a type of economic system to deal with the problems that arose out of the Great Depression and the problems of restructuring Europe after the Second World War. And they came up with this thing called Keynesianism, which is named after uh, an English economist called John Maynard Keynes, uh, who was very influential at the time. Um, interestingly, there's a bit of an aside, a member of the Bloomsbury set in, in England, so he was sort of from an elite artistic group, yet he was also um, a very influential economist. And his, his notion of the, the sort of Keynesian method of managing the economy saw a welfare state where people were looked after um, by the state who couldn't look after themselves sufficiently or found themselves in a position where they couldn't look after themselves for a short period of time due to unemployment or ill health or old age. Um, and also the government, the idea was that the government interceded in the economy when it started to bust because capitalism is, capitalism is a boom bust system. Um, uh, and so the idea of Keynesianism was when we're in the bust period where the capitalists are going, well, no thanks, we're not going to be involved in the economy anymore until things get better and then we'll come back in when it's in our interests. Um, uh, governments interceded in the economy to, to keep it stimulated. This is why one of the reasons why we survived the global financial crisis, because the government did do those sort of things and intercede in the economy, um, despite all the whinging and complaining about bats in roofs and um, uh, school halls. That activity was the stuff that kept the economy ticking over while the capitalists were hanging back waiting for it to get better because the, the, they didn't want to risk investment where they weren't certain that they would get a return on that investment. So you know, capitalism is not particularly interested in the welfare of the, the economy, they're in, interested in the welfare of, of their, uh, their shareholders. So anyway, what this imposition of the welfare state actually, and sort of ironically from this Marxist class point of view, um, protected capitalism from the revolt of the masses. So while ever um, the government was protecting people from the ravages of, of capitalism, if you like, from the, the boom-bust cycle, or what they call the business cycle these days, um, there was, there's no really strong impetus for, for people to rise up and revolt. Um, have a look at Greece at the moment and you get a bit of an idea of what might happen in a situation where the government isn't able to protect the people from the ravages of the capitalist process and you've got an idea of what Marx was talking about. So for Marx there were two groups. Now Marxism is still useful today, um, it comes in a, in a couple of different forms um, these days. There's neo-Marxism which is um, or a modified version of, of Marxism and, and there's still a strict Marxist view in sociology. Now when I talk about this I'm not talking about sociologists who use this as being communists or Marxist. What I'm talking about is a way of analysing uh, the economic world because what we use this for is that it's, it's Marx, has, Marx has an enormous body, an unbelievably large body of work and this 
this informs us theoretically. So it gives us the tools to look at how the capitalist process works from a particular perspective. That's how Marxism is used in, in sociology. So it's not so much used as an ideology um, or as a, an argument for a particular way of organising the economy. It's used as a way of analysing how the economy works. Um, so, but if you're applying Marxism today, it's it's much more difficult to see. It's much more difficult to see a distinct bourgeoisie in the sense that you can't identify an owner of the means of production. Whereas back in the the 18th and 19th century, you could go and knock on the door of a factory and you could find the owner. And if you've seen Dickens, it's the blokes in the big tall hats with the dark coats who are always grumpy and pushing their workers around. These, these were the owners of the means of production and were identifiable. Today, obviously, there aren't many owners of the means of production anymore. In the, in, in the smaller business world, you can still identify these people. Um, in the big, large corporate industrial world, much harder to find these people. Boards of directors sort of conform to that. Um, um, chief executive officers and management groups conform to that to a certain extent, but th these people still can arbitrarily lose, lose their jobs. The people, the, the, the hedge funds and the large organisations that hold the shares are also these people. So it's a little more fractious and a little more difficult to identify the bourgeoisie. Nonetheless, there is still a bourgeoisie. How we would refine that um, from a Marxist point of view is that we, we talk about the owners and in brackets you would put in, and controllers of the means of production these days. Um, Rupert Murdoch's probably one of the few examples where you could identify an owner of the means of production, despite the fact that he owns, I don't know, around 30% of the family owns around 30% of the shares. I think they have 70% of the voting rights. So you still have one bloke who is con in control of a large organisation, but that's, that's rare. Nonetheless, you can still usefully use Marx to understand a division between the rich and the powerful and the nominally working class, and I'll put that in inverted commas, who were subject to the power and influence of, of the, um, the owners or controls of the means of production. So the key thing to understand about Marx is the, the, this distinction between those who use the means of production as a form of power and those who are subject to that power. Now Weber came along, like I was saying earlier, um, a little bit after Marx, had the benefit of seeing Marx's work and understanding Marx's work um, and modified it a bit because it is, and I <laughs> I say this a little uncomfortably because Marx was a huge intellect. Um, this division is a little crude, if you like, um, a little too simplistic. And Weber, Weber acknowledged that there, there, there are divisions in society and they are economic, but they're not exclusively economic. So what, what Weber had to say was that, that it's probably useful to see three categories, three divisions, three stratified layers if you like, of difference in, um, in the social world. And he called those class, status and party. So what, what Weber was trying to do was explain the differences that we would all see now between um, certain groups in society that can't simply be, be explained by bosses and workers. So what, what Weber said is, well, we have this, this group called class, which is a little misleading. Um, and he said class is simply determined in the marketplace. Class is determined by how much power you have in the marketplace, and that will be determined essentially by income. Um, so the greater your income, the greater influence you have in the market, and the influence in the market is, is determined by how much, how much interest you have in it, and that's measured by money, um, will determine your class position. But that doesn't explain everything because a lot of plumbers would earn a lot more money than I would. So you have a plumber who is in a higher class than somebody who's uh, a, a lecturer with a PhD who can give somebody a card that says doctor somebody on it. Um, so 
apart from that, the other thing that we want to we want to wrestle with is is the crude measure of of money being the determinant of class. So apart from the notion of of different types of of jobs maybe being having more cachet than others, there's also the contribution and and the quality of what you have to give. And so to society that determines how society sees you because class is also measured by what what Weber described as social honor as well and so this is the second category which he calls status and this accounts for the difference in social honor that's accorded to people now while you may have a plumber and I'm just choosing plumbers because it dropped into my head who's earning a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars a year while we're not decrying that or um, dismissing what they do we've we've got to wrestle with the idea that there may be people there may be volunteers um, who who are doing good works in society who deserve some sort of social recognition or social honor um, um, there'll be people who work for the Red Cross, Médecins Sans Frontières, those sort of people who, who, are, who are doing good works that are contributing to the betterment of society but aren't being rewarded through a high income. So what we do is afford them higher status. Um, so while we're not decrying what, what plumbers doing and without plumbers we have a problem in society but we don't simply want to measure people by the amount of income they earn. So we, we've got this other category called status, um, which then uh, awards social honour to people based on, on the perception of what they do in terms of, of what it contributes and, and the, the, the status that we offer that. It's also, it also allows us to read people and read, read the symbols that I was talking about earlier. Um, as, as markers of, of social class. So there are other things you'll look for too in terms of status. You'll, you'll look for, um, you'll attribute a, 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 a class position in, in its broad sense um, on the basis of language, education, the way you dress, the, the stuff you own, how you present yourself in society. All of these are the more subtle symbolic uh, again, going back to what I was talking about in the, the previous lecture, all these symbolic, non-material uh, representations of, of your, your position uh, so that, that we will make judgments on, on more ephemeral, less material um, objects in terms of, of how we afford social honour, which is, then balances out the, the crudeness of, of the measure of, sim of what Weber calls class, that is your influence in the marketplace. Then there's also another category who he calls group, uh, um, so it calls party. Um, so you've got class days party and party is where groups form in order to to bring about influence that they possibly can't have as individuals but collectively um, they, they'll have they'll have influence. And the, the obvious example of that is, is, um, is unions. Unions come together, uh, unions of working class people um, who don't have influence as individuals. So if you're uh, one of those women who works in hotels around the capital cities changing beds and cleaning the rooms, who along with, although it's only just recently changed, um, again, mainly women who work in um, childcare, you're the lowest paid people in Australia and as an individual there's not much strength in terms of negotiation, negotiating ability um, that you have to bring to, to the table when you, you're trying to increase your wages. But as a collective group you have much more power and that then increases, increases your, uh, your status in, in the social world and allows you to, to have much greater influence than, than you would as an individual. So. What Weber has done is, is sort of refined the processes of, of, that were initiated by Marx um, in looking at how, how we divide up society. Now, um, most, most ways of perceiving class and perceiving these divisions in society are, are built on these two. So there are, there are a couple of other people who are worth looking at. There's, there's Goldthorpe, 
who essentially talks about these divisions but in a more refined way, and an Australian um, sociologist um, called, um, I think he was writing as Bob Connell when he was writing about class, now writes as Raywin Connell um, when she's writing about, about theory. So. Um, Worthwhile having a look at those. There's the, um, now. What have I given you? Um, there will be. There are references in. Um, oh, look! Have a look at this book. Um, I've referred to it in other, in in other other lectures. Uh, Public sociology, which is um, one of the other texts that I use occasionally. It's it's Germov and Poole. You'll find it. Um, you find it in the libraries, um, and if you go to Allen and Unwin, who are the um, the publishers, um, you'll get more information. Allen and Unwin, you get more information and access to some of the material. Um, that's an Australian publication, so you'll be able to um, to look up some of the stuff on, on class in Australia. The other interesting one is, and I'll get the new version, which is this one, which is um, Australian Sociology, um, which is Holmes, Hughes and Julian, um, produced by the same people uh, who've produced your textbook, Pearson Education. That's also a good one to have, have a look at as well. Uh, and that's their website, um, www.com.au Pearson um, Higher Ed Homes. So, uh, and you'll be able to get these from, um, from well, you, certainly from university libraries. And, and if, you go, if you've got a good big public municipal library and you go to the 301 section, you'll find lots of um, uh, good, uh, quality sociology books. There aren't a lot of sociology books that are <laughs> written by people who don't know anything about sociology. Um, so you're usually usually pretty safe, but just run it by your um, your tutors if you're uh, if you're not sure. Um, so I invite you to have a look at the Australian stuff on class, but that gives you the basics of foundational stuff on on class to start building on. So I'll see you for lecture five, either next week or shortly. Bye. This has been a Swinburne production.